Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Freedom from Chronic Pain, the seven week journey to rewire your subconscious mind to dissolve pain programming. I'm Lise Bonis and I'm really looking forward to this Q&A conversation for the Shift Network where we'll explore the teachings of Hal Greenham and Dr. Howard Schubiner and address questions about their upcoming seven week course, Freedom from Chronic Pain, which begins Wednesday, November 6th. A little later, I'll explain how you can participate in the course, even if you can't attend the live sessions, but first, I want to introduce our guests. Hal Greenham is a somatic psychotherapist and the clinical director and co-founder of Freedom from Chronic Pain. After recovering from his own chronic pain with a neuroplasticity and psychotherapy intervention, he retained studying psycho psychology in a number of schools of psychotherapy. Hal specializes in treating chronic pain conditions using the freedom from chronic pain approach, which combines the insights of his work as a therapist with the neuroplasticity techniques of Dr. Schubiner. Howard Schubiner, MD, is the clinical director, medical advisor, and co-founder of Freedom from Chronic Pain. He's the director of the Mind Body Medicine Program at Ascension Providence Hospital in Southfield, Michigan. He's also the author of Unlearn Your Pain and Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression, and the co-author of Hidden from View with Dr. Alan Abbas. He was included on the list of best doctors in America four years in a row. And in just a few minutes, we're gonna open up for your questions, but first, I want to bring Hal and Howard online. Welcome to you both. It's great to be with you this evening. Hey there. Hi, Lisa, thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started here. Your topic is fascinating. I'm, I've got a personal interest, that's for sure. Uh, let's start out though, uh, Howard, would you please start us off with, um, I guess, a brief description of the brain and the role that it plays in pain? Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. Frankly, I could talk all day about this, and I often do, but to be brief and succinct, advancing neuroscience uh, understanding has led us to now know that all, all pain is actually created by the brain. Of course, an injury can trigger the brain to create pain, but there's been hundreds of cases where people had a significant or even severe physical injury and actually had no pain, mainly because the brain was occupied with something else or there was something else more important that the brain had to attend to. And we also know, now know that stress and emotional distress activates the exact same neural circuits in the brain as does a physical injury. So people who are stuck in emotional situations where they lose a loved one, where they're micromanaged, where they're betrayed, uh, any kind of significant emotional distress can activate pain pathways that are real. Because all pain is real, all pain is created by the brain. And acute pain can persist and develop into chronic pain when there's ongoing stressful situations in one life, and when <laughs> there's tremendous fear or worry about the pain, and number three, when there's unresolved emotional issues. And so that's, uh, that's why Hal and I work together very well, because of our uh, understanding of both the medical and the psychological aspects of chronic pain. Okay, well, let's go ahead and dive into that a little bit. Hal, would you tell us just a little bit about uh, the emotional work that's sometimes required to recover or to just move past pain? Sure, Lisa. Well, yeah, so building on what Howard shared about the brain, you know, we dedicated half of this upcoming course to giving people practical emotional tools because uh, as well as working with the neural pathways, the neuroplasticity, uh, changing neural pathways in the brain to shift people's uh, perception and experience of pain, it's often really important to 
come more into contact with underlying feelings that maybe part of the brain has, bro- has blocked off uh, at, at, a, at an earlier time of life because it might have perceived those feelings as threatening or dangerous or perhaps we grew up in a childhood environment where certain feelings weren't allowed or certain feelings were overexpressed and others denied. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a fascinating and incredibly rewarding uh, area of psychology and medicine that we work in because we regularly see that when people are giving, given meaningful tools to actually get more in touch with their feelings and themselves to work out what the key issues are on that emotional level and how that affects the functioning of the nervous system, uh, we regularly see the disappearance of, you know, long-held pain that could have been there for months or years or sometimes even decades. That's pretty amazing. Wow. Uh, As I mentioned, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and let's see what our viewers have to say. Uh, We have the rest of our time together to dive into our viewers' questions for both Hal and Howard as we prepare for their upcoming course. Again, that's called Freedom from Chronic Pain, and it begins Wednesday, November 6th. And if you want to check out the website and learn more about the seven-week course, you can visit freedomfromchronicpaincourse.com to see the full description. So let's go ahead and dive into some questions here. Uh, if you have a question for Hal or Howard, just go ahead and type it in. I'll be happy to read them aloud. And I have plenty waiting for us already. Um, and I'd like to sort of distill. There's a, there's a lot of questions about the same thing. And there are people who are asking, what do you have to say about the idea that it's all in your head? That's sort of a, an accusation that some people have heard. And it, it almost sounds like they're being accused of making it up. I have been accused uh, of that by people who are not understanding of our model. Anybody who says pain is all in your head is either cruel or ignorant or both. Because when they say it's all in your head, they're implying somehow that the pain isn't real, that it's fake, it's imaginary, that you want the pain, that it's your fault that you're having the pain, or that you're crazy or nuts. And none of that is remotely true. It turns out that, as I mentioned, all pain is created by the brain, by neural circuits. And so when my patients really understand what's going on, they understand that we're not blaming them, that we understand the pain is real, all too real. I've been there and Hal's been there. When they understand that, then they're excited to say, I'm so glad it's not all in my head. And I'm really glad that it's actually in my brain, because that means there's hope. That means there's a chance, often a really good chance, that this pain is reversible. Hmm. Okay, well, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, there's a question here about, uh, from Michael who says, I have anxiety attacks, which are physically painful. How can your work help with this? And would you talk about the mechanics of how fear can actually cause pain? So perhaps I'll start with that. Um, that's a great question for us because we work with anxiety uh, also depression and pain hand in hand was essentially <clears throat> we see them as um, manifestations of the same underlying neurological process. Uh, so, you know, it's, ext- it's extremely common that people will experience some kind of anxiety as well as a physical symptom. But even if they don't, even if uh, people are just experiencing, say, panic attacks, or back pain or irritable bowel syndrome or one of the many chronic pain syndromes, then this program will be appropriate for them. So uh, in terms of the second part of the question around how does fear relate to uh, the chronicity of of the uh, symptoms that are being experienced, well, fear is an absolutely key perpetuating factor And it turns out that fear is uh, a key factor in sensitizing the brain and in the 
danger alarm mechanism, which is a central part of the perpetuation of the physical symptoms. How do you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure, Hal. Um, it turns out that we can't control the danger alarm activation in our brain because it's subconscious and it reacts to many things that occur in our lives, uh, particularly emotional disturbances. And therefore, we can't necessarily go in and say, turn off. We can't necessarily control the pain or anxiety. But the key fact, as you pointed out, that causes perpetuation of the danger alarm mechanism being activated and pain or anxiety is the response to the symptoms and this response of fear, this response of focusing on the pain, this response of worrying about the pain, this response of thinking that the pain or anxiety is incurable or will never go away. All those reactions are within our control and a key a key component of our program is helping people understand that and giving people the tools to alter their responses to these symptoms and by that mechanism then turning down the danger alarm process and reducing and hopefully eliminating pain and anxiety. Hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, this is, a, again, a dual question here. One person is asking, uh, shouldn't the physical reasons behind chronic pain be addressed first? And then another person is asking, how can I tell when the pain I'm feeling needs medical attention? Uh, as Hal was just saying, that's a great question. We come up with that. Every, we come up to those questions every day. It's critical to make an accurate diagnosis to understand what's causing the pain. It turns out that the vast majority of chronic pain is not due to structural injuries. It's often thought that there's a structural injury. It can be. I certainly see people like that. And I'm the first to, be, uh, to tell people when there's any doubt or if I think there is a structural problem. And as part of this program, I'll be giving that kind of advice to people. I'll be taking their questions and helping them sort it out. But if someone had an injury one or two or 10 years ago, and they're still having pain at the site of that injury, that doesn't mean that the injury is the cause of that pain now, because injuries heal. Uh, when people have back or neck pain, and they get an MRI of their back or neck, typically that MRI will be abnormal. But it it usually is not abnormal in the sense of having a tumor or fracture or an infection. It's abnormal in the sense of having degenerative discs or bulging discs, which are normal in the population. So uh, our job is to help sort that out because when you understand the truth about your pain, which is usually, not always, but usually that it's the brain activating pain, then it's a huge first step in beginning to reduce fear and beginning to, uh, to turn these neural circuits of pain off. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's take that a little further. Uh, Rebecca wants to know, she says, I realize that my anxiety and depression has had a profound impact on triggering several chronic illnesses. Should I work on unlearning that first before taking the course? Cal, do you want to do that one? Well, uh, perhaps it depends a little bit on what the chronic illnesses are. Perhaps uh, you could ask, sorry, what was her name? If she could, um, she could just type a little bit more into the Facebook chat. Um, I mean, <clears throat> if it's some of the diagnoses that we mentioned before, if it's fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, um, chronic back pain, headaches, other musculoskeletal pain, then, as I said before, you know, uh, this approach is the right approach for dealing with those kinds of issues and anxiety and depression, and we just deal with them all together because they're basically manifestations of the same underlying process. 
Now, if it's something like an autoimmune condition, uh, then that's not something that we're offering treatment for. So, yeah, we might just need to know a little bit more about the uh, specific uh, diagnosis that she's talking about. Okay, she's saying that it's uh, lupus. Yeah, How do you lupus. want to comment? Yeah, lupus is an autoimmune condition. It's a, a physical disorder. It can certainly cause a whole variety of symptoms. And so in that situation, uh, what we're, but on this, at the same time, uh, lupus can be aggravated by stress and emotions and by anxiety and depression. And so what we'd be working on with that person is seeing if the lupus can be treated medically and at the same time using our treatment to unwind the neural circuits that may be aggravating it. Oftentimes, someone has a diagnosis of lupus, but the actual symptoms that they may be experiencing at the moment are not actually due to the lupus because that's being treated or that's under control. So again, it's a question of drilling down and investigating uh, into what's actually going on in the moment. And we've got a, a variety of ways of doing that and helping people investigate and look at in the details of the symptoms that they're having, and that helps us to determine if those symptoms are in fact being caused by neural circuits in the brain or not. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we are getting a lot of questions from people about fibromyalgia, so let's just make that an umbrella topic. Please just address what, how, how your method can help with that? Fibromyalgia is a disorder in which it's, it, it consists of people of chronic widespread pain that is not due to a structural abnormality, such as an autoimmune disease or other neurologic or another uh, neurologic type disorder. So therefore, by definition, fibromyalgia is pain. It's real pain. It's coming from neural circuits in the brain. It is not a structural problem. That's been proven many times in all the research studies. And um, that's one of the most common things that we treat and that we treat successfully. Uh, typically, one of the clues, as I was kind of mentioning before, one of the clues that we investigate about pain in general, is if the pain moves from one place to another within the body, if it turns on and off, if it spreads, if it shifts. And in fibromyalgia, that's the classic situation where one minute or one hour, the pain may be in the right arm, and then it may go to the left arm, or it may move from the arms to the legs, or it may shift into the back, lower back, and then it may shift into the upper back. These are signs that this, these pains are due to neural circuits in the brain because neural circuits in the brain are really good at turning on and off, shifting, moving, and that helps us dramatically in helping us make that diagnosis, but also in helping people with this disorder see that and understand that so they know what's going on as opposed to just being in the dark and, and wondering why they have so much pain and why it keeps moving around. I wanted to comment as well on fibromyalgia. <clears throat> um, it's something that we're both passionate about because in this, um, in this area of chronic pain, which has a lot of kind of gray, gray areas in medicine, um, it's one of the conditions that we see so frequently where it's really exacerbated by people having a sense of hopelessness or helplessness around their condition. And um, we talked about the importance of fear and fear of the symptoms before in perpetuating symptoms. Uh, in my own personal experience, I had uh, widespread pain that didn't go away for uh, about four years until I applied the mind-body treatment and recovered fully. And during my own journey, I met the diagnostic criteria for both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia syndrome. And I remember thinking to myself how grateful I was that a doctor who saw me diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome because I'd heard of people 
with chronic fatigue syndrome who'd recovered, and I hadn't heard of anyone with fibromyalgia uh, syndrome diagnosis actually recovering. So the message that I have for people with fibromyalgia is that we regard fibromyalgia as a form of uh, what we call mind-body syndrome or psychophysiological disorder, and we do regard it as treatable. We know that um, there still are many doctors who will describe it as not treatable, and yeah, that's uh, that's something that respectfully we do differ on. We like to give people, uh, you know, what, what we believe is evidence-based hope that they can either improve or recover from their fibromyalgia symptoms by applying the principles that we teach in this course, doing neurological work, and often with fibromyalgia, having to do some emotional work. Sometimes there's trauma that's underlying. Uh, don't expect it to go away in days or weeks. Sometimes it can take a bit longer, but we really do encourage people to work on it. I think people can really make progress. Hmm. But uh, what often happens is with these two conditions and, and many others, when people go online and go to support groups and go to Facebook groups, the people who are on those sites are the people who've not recovered. The people on those sites are the ones who have been told it's incurable and uh, who are hopeless. And the more you read those stories and the more you interact with those folks, oftentimes people get worse. Uh, and we have done, the group that I'm associated with has conducted three research studies uh, in with people with fibromyalgia showing that uh, people can recover. And so that's why we're so excited to bring this work to more people uh, because so many people have been told they're, they're incurable. So many people have been, uh, have had their, uh, have been frustrated and suffering for, for some, for so many years. Hmm. Well, that's excellent news. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's another uh, question that a few people are asking about. What about uh, complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS? Is that uh, something that your course will help with? We do. We do treat that disorder. I've seen a number of people with it. Uh, it's, again, one of those disorders where the medical profession just kind of shakes their head and says, you know, we don't know. Uh, when you read about CRPS... The cause is unknown, the treatment is unknown, the cure rate is low. Uh, it's something that's just completely enigmatic. Uh, but we see it all the time. And uh, it basically just means someone who has pain in a certain area where there was typically no injury. Oftentimes there may be uh, 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 an, injur uh, an injury to an adjacent area or nearby area or a surgery, like someone who has a knee surgery, and then their foot starts hurting. And it just makes no sense unless you understand the danger alarm mechanism in the brain, unless you understand that in people who've had difficulty in, in their life and have had trauma and have felt unsafe in their life, when they fall into a situation where they're injured or have surgery, which is certainly a form of injury, their brain interprets that as an assault. And the danger signal gets ramped up, and it can create pain and swelling and skin changes and a whole variety of things, which we lump under the diagnosis of CRPS. I'll just add to that. I mean, it's quite similar to the situation with fibromyalgia. The lack of correct understanding about it in the medical community means that unknowingly, doctors and other practitioners often, people, often make people more scared of their symptoms, tell them that, oh, we don't know what this is. You know, you're going to have to learn to live with the pain. You can only manage it. You can't cure it, which just tends to make it worse. So again, yeah, we're excited to offer this program as a form of practical, uh, practical hope and an effective treatment for these kinds of presentations. Hmm. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, let's change uh, subjects entirely. We've got a question here from Theodora who says, I've been finding it difficult to focus, and it seems to me that focus would be important in the technique that you teach, and my concern is that I won't be able to do it. 
Well, I would say I'd be curious about, you know, what's what's going on with the lack of ability to focus. It obviously sounds like it's a symptom within itself, you know, that we might look at addressing through some of the psychological techniques that we work with. So we offer techniques ranging from mindfulness uh, through to somatic psychotherapy, techniques from internal family systems, inner child work. You know, often if there's a lack of focus, we need to kind of dig a little bit deeper and try and work out, well, what's driving that? You know, when did it start? And so I would say, uh, you know, that, that would be the starting that would be the starting point, and then maybe you might move on to working on the uh, pain symptoms or the other symptoms after that. Huh. On, a, on another level, uh, inability to focus could be interpreted as I can't focus for a long time. I can't meditate. I'm not good at meditation. I'm not good at, at long-term focusing, and this program does not require that. Uh, this is not a program that requires uh, long-term sitting practice or long-term focusing practice. Uh, it's a program that relies on rewiring and reprogramming neural circuits in the brain. And this is often done in very short snippets of calming the brain, soothing the brain, uh, changing, changing the circuits in the brain through the, you know, the magic of neuroplasticity. And so it's often uh, more effective to have very short intervention, uh, very short interventions on a repeated basis. Hmm. Well, that's good news for those of us who are distracted by shiny objects. <laughs> and those of you who are just joining us, uh, we're here with Hal Greenham and Howard Schubiner, learning about their upcoming course, Freedom from Chronic Pain, which begins Wednesday, November 6th. And you can log on to freedomfromchronicpaincourse.com for all the details and to register. And let's get back into this conversation. We've got a lot of really good questions. Um, you, uh, you were talking a little bit about IBS a little earlier. And Tanya here says, my doctor says nothing can be done about IBS. What are your thoughts? That's malarkey. <laughs> what do you say in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> what would <laughs> what's an Australian? I can think of a few words. Um, what? Probably not allowed to say them right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe given it's IBS, uh, BS is one of the words that comes to mind. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Al. I, I knew I could count on you. <laughs> well, well yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, we see IBS all the time. Yeah, it's one of the things that responds super well to uh, to this kind of treatment. And yeah, it's, Howard. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's just there's. Remember, I was saying before about when someone said it's all in your head, it's because they're being cruel or ignorant or both. This is a case of ignorance. Uh, you know, and it's not. I'm not that I'm blaming physicians or or medical personnel. It's just that that's what they've been trained at. That's what they've been told. And so they're afraid to give people hope. Uh, but the fact is, is that there's been so many advancements in neuroscience and understanding how the brain works. And those advancements in understanding how the brain works have just not filtered down into typical medical practice. And so... Most of the time, the referrals that we get do not come from other physicians. They come from people themselves. They come from people who are suffering because those are the people who are, have the motivation to figure out what's going on and not stop until they find something that works. And so uh, uh, most of the time, it's people finding us uh, through internet searching, through, through just looking. And, and not giving up. And that's the message that we really have for people uh, with chronic pain is to not give up. Right, right. Well, that, that, again, that's good news because I know that when you are dealing with pain, it's easy to just give up because uh, it's either that or opioids. And uh, that's not a very good choice, is it? 
Yeah, so um, we've got a question think, here. From, it's maybe it's just go ahead. it's perhaps also just important to to mention, you know, that there are some forms not claiming that we can treat all forms of chronic pain. You know, there are some forms like auto, autoimmune disease or if the pain is coming from cancer or some kind of um, infectious process or something. Uh, but the fact of the matter is those kinds of diagnoses are usually easily, easily made by a doctor and they're also in the minority compared to number of people who have chronic pain conditions that are poorly understood by medicine, which usually a mind-body approach will be an effective treatment for. Okay. Uh, so uh, Rebecca says a family member has severe pain in her lower back and right leg, and her phys physician says it's probably caused by scoliosis, which is squeezing her nerves. How could your approach help her? One of the things we've learned over the years uh, is that Disorders that we knew were not dangerous or damaging are now being blamed for a whole host of things. Scoliosis is one of those. Uh, I've worked with a lot of physicians, uh, back specialists, and physical medicine specialists, and I've been a doctor for a long time now. And the fact of the matter is, is that just scoliosis in and of itself does not cause pain like this. Uh, and so what happens is, is that because physicians need to explain pain and tell people what's wrong with them, they will tend to use something that's there, such as degenerative discs, bulging discs, or scoliosis as a reason for it. When many people have scoliosis and degenerative discs and bulging discs, this is very common, that have no pain at all. And so uh, I would not assume that her, this person's pain is due to scoliosis to start with. And then, as I mentioned, we can help her or you investigate this, this pain and look at if it shifts, if it moves, what brings it on? Is it triggered? Is it worse with the weather? Is it worse with wind? Is it worse with heat or cold? Um, and look for some of the inconsistencies that give us the evidence and the clues for it being a neural circuit disorder rather than a structural disorder. So that's how we approach that. Okay. Go ahead, Hal. No, no, I didn't have anything to add. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say something. Well, then uh, let me ask, Howard, you just mentioned that sometimes the weather and the wind can actually cause physical symptoms, and that's intriguing. Would you uh, explain that a little? Yeah, that's one of the things we look for in our diagnosis is these triggered phenomena. When someone has significant or severe pain that's triggered by light touch, well, we know that's the brain because light touch is innocuous. Wind is innocuous. Wind doesn't cause chronic pain, but it can trigger the brain to activate pain. And when we see that pattern, then we have the evidence that it's the brain doing it and not a structural problem. The weather is an amazing one because uh, it's, it's, in essence, kind of a long story, but everyone seems to know that weather causes pain. But the research shows that weather does not cause pain. And so when we see someone who has a pain syndrome that's activated by a uh, change in the weather, that is actually evidence that it's the brain rather than the body, even though, uh, you know, people think of it in the opposite direction. Huh, interesting. I think we've all seen the Beverly Hillbillies where Granny's rheumatiz uh, would kick up when, when, uh, when there was a storm a coming. Is there any truth to that? Well, see, it becomes learned. Uh, triggers are conditioned responses. When you think of Pavlov and his dogs, the dog's, the dog's brains learn that uh, a buzzer would lead to food, and so then a buzzer would lead to the, the dog salivating. And it's really the same phenomenon that occurs in all of us. Uh, when you, what happens when... Uh, you remember the times when bad weather causes pain, and we forget the times when it doesn't. 
And then you're expecting that bad weather will cause pain. And this is all happening on a subconscious level. And then the weather will actually, quote, cause pain or trigger pain, so to speak. But we see this with foods. A lot of people have foods that trigger uh, bloating or stomach pain. And most of the time, it turns out it's not the food itself. It's just that the food has triggered the brain to activate uh, the symptom. So it's called, you know, obviously it's called a conditioned response. It's extremely common. And, uh, you know, I think Granny was a little bit upset with Jed at times. You know, that may be part of it. <laughs> it was probably Jethro she was mad at. <laughs> Oh, we've got a question here from Angela who says, uh, my job, which I enjoy, requires me to sit at a computer or hunched over a mobile device all day. I take plenty of breaks and I stretch, but my shoulders and upper back ache horribly because aside from sleeping at night, I spend more time at the computer or device than doing anything else. How is it possible to keep my job without being in pain all the time? Well, uh, this is a really important question and a common question. Uh, first of all, uh, if she, is it she or he, I can't remember, uh, if she can uh, change the ergonomics of her situation, that can certainly be helpful. Uh, there's no question that uh, if you're in a, a bad posture, you will get tension if you do that for a long time. On the other hand, uh, what we found is that posture is rarely the sole cause of severe and chronic pain. If there's certain, if she's having some tension in the back of her neck and it goes away with rest, then, you know, changing the posture can certainly help. But if she's developing severe pain that's causing her to be unable to work, uh, most likely it's because the neural circuits in her brain are being activated by her fear of typing, her fear, and maybe it's not a conscious fear, uh, and but it's the subconscious fear that she's doing harm or that she, this is dangerous for her or this is bad. And even if you love your job, if there is a sense of fear and danger about what you're doing on a daily basis, that can translate into chronic pain. Cal, you had pain with typing, didn't you? I sure did. I had a few years of pain from typing and mousing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that mousing. an Australian? <laughs> <laughs> using using a mouse, Howard. Sorry, I'll um, I'll bring the dictionary for you next time. Okay. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I I liked how you answered that. I really agree. I think you know you want to look. She wants to maybe look at the ergonomics, first of all, but it doesn't really sound like the ergonomics are the key, you know. Um, so we'd want to kind of look at uh, what, what Howard mentioned about, you know, is there kind of fear about, oh, I'm not going to be able to work now, I've got this pain, and then that kind of, you know, fear can cascade into catastrophizing and make the pain worse, make the tension worse. We could just start to wind wind that back uh, by working with the fear and then we might also want to look at the bigger picture and say well you know why is this kind of um, bodily tension and um, this pain manifesting in a work context are there some other issues is there some tension uh, around work her relationship with work stress or could be a relationship with a supervisor or a boss something like that often um, you know, there can be a couple of intertwined things going on. And as Howard mentioned, they're not always, not always conscious. And I guess that's where people can get stuck. Um, and it takes a little bit of work sometimes to just be able to sink into the unconscious layers of what can be driving some of these symptoms. Hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, looking at the clock here, we have time for uh, a few more questions, but uh, before we get into those, uh, I'd like to answer some questions about the course itself. We're getting some of those as well, and I'll go ahead and handle those. Uh, once again, the course is called Freedom from Chronic Pain, and this is going to be a, a really powerful seven-week journey under Helen Howard's expert guidance where uh, you'll find relief from tension headaches, back pain, TMJ, IBS, fibromyalgia, and more through scientifically proven techniques that address pain at its core. Uh, the, and the seven-week course takes place on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, starting Wednesday, November 6th. And if you can't join us live, that's fine. You won't miss out on the teachings because you'll receive uh, audio and video recordings, transcripts, and all course handouts on your course homepage. Also, I'd like to remind everyone that the Shift Network offers a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks until uh, November 20th, in this case, to make sure that you absolutely love it and that it's working for you. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can stay connected with one another. Also, everyone who registers receives the Freedom from Chronic Pain bonus collection. And first, you'll receive an ebook from Dawson Church entitled Psychological Trauma Healing Its Roots in Brain, Body, and Memory. And next, you'll get a video dialogue with Wendy Coulter from the 2019 Science and Spirituality Summit called Medical Intuition Blazing a Trail for Holistic Health. Then you'll receive an audio dialogue with Dr. Tripti Gokhani from the 2018 Winter of Wellness Summit entitled Identifying with Your Pain Type. And when you register by midnight Pacific time on Wednesday, October 30th, you receive an extra bonus and that is an audio dialogue with Dr. Margaret Paul called Inner Bonding, Six Steps to Self-Love, Vibrancy, Passion, and Fulfillment. So I think that answers all the questions about the course that have come in. So before we get back into questions, let me ask you both, Hal and Howard, uh, what are you both most looking forward to sharing in the upcoming course? Let's start with Hal. Uh, well, I think for me, it's just an honor and a privilege to share what I've learned so far in my journey. I had a very personal journey into pain and thankfully out of it again. So it just is uh, so gratifying to be able to give people practical tools to do this meaningful work, you know, for themselves to get, get them help, get them out of pain. And, um, you know, the great thing is that uh, particularly with the inner child and the internal family systems kind of aspects of the work that we're going to be offering as part of the course. It's not only physical uh, benefits in physical health that people could expect from doing the course because as we learn to make that um, secure and meaningful, authentic connection with our inner self, then we, we kind of learn a life, a skill that, a skill that we can have for life in learning to just naturally calm the nervous system, which is at the core of learning to calm and heal these physical uh, pain symptoms. So, yeah, basically it's uh, I'm just excited about sharing the stuff that, that has helped me and helped a lot of other people. Um, yeah, thanks. So thanks to the Shift Network for the opportunity. As for me, you're asking me the same question. Uh, well, first of all, it's it's really fun to work with Hal because he usually laughs at my jokes, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but on a broader sense, it's really critical for me to participate in something that advances our understanding of the neuroscience of pain. Uh, there's a paradigm shift that's beginning to happen in this field. And it's a huge shift that affects uh, medicine and health and society. Um, and everyone who takes this course is going to be part of that paradigm shift because they're not only going to hopefully benefit themselves, but they're going to talk to their friends and neighbors and colleagues. And more and more people will begin to understand the role of the brain in pain. And that will help other people 
there's millions and millions of people all around the country, all around the world suffering more people than have chronic pain than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. And so this is uh, critically important, I think, for uh, the well-being of uh, our society at large. Hmm. All right. Wow. Uh, it, really, this just sounds like such a wonderful thing. Thank you for, for offering this. Uh, it, let's get back to the questions here. We've got a lot of people asking about uh, the various different kinds of arthritis. So I wonder if you can, once again, let's make that an umbrella topic and let's just talk about how can this help the, the various forms of arthritis? Uh, mo the most common form of arthritis is osteoarthritis, the quote wear and tear arthritis. And everyone has that. Everyone has that to some degree and it tends to increase with age. On the other hand, pain, significant pain does not increase with age. And so when you get an when you have pain and you get an x-ray or an mri and the x-ray says oh you've got arthritis uh, how do we know that that arthritis is actually the cause of the pain that's what we need to go into and understand because most people who have evidence of arthritis do not have any pain at all um on the other hand there are types of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis other forms of inflammatory arthritis that uh can certainly cause pain and often do, and it's our job to help sort that out for people. And then finally, some people with osteoarthritis have such a severe form of that that they actually do need a knee replacement or a hip replacement, and that can happen. Uh, again, our job is to sort that out, but most people who have evidence of arthritis on an x-ray or an MRI, that amount of arthritis, mild to moderate, is not the cause of their pain. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Hal, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, <clears throat> I probably won't add any more to that. I mean, I, I perhaps I could say, you know, people were telling me that my RSI might have been a form of arth arthritis. My pain started with an RSI in my wrists, and, of course, it wasn't anything to do with... Um, with bones or joints um, or, in fact, even muscles. So um, perhaps I could just add that, you know, it does seem that arthritis is another one of those kind of catch-all terms that is often, uh, often blamed for why people have pain. But the truth is uh, it's, it's much less often the actual cause of pain. And so... People have received a diagnosis of arthritis, then yeah, they really um, owe it to themselves to carefully investigate if it is truly cause of their pain or not. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, let's go to a question here from Ruth Ellen who says, Why am I sometimes able to control my pain through meditation and intention and sometimes not? Well, first of all, when that happens, that's evidence that it's the brain doing it. When you can, quote, control your pain with meditation or intention, that's showing that you're using neuroplasticity to alter the neural circuits in the brain, and that's evidence that the pain is due to these neural circuits and that you're not damaged. So first of all, so that's great news. Now the question is, how can we help you to be, do that more effectively? And that's exactly what our program does. It's to help people understand their pain on a neurologic, neuroscience level and to give them the tools to gradually unwind the danger alarm mechanism so that less and less of the time they're in pain. Sometimes what happens is uh, that because the pain is so uh, severe and worrisome and causes such fear, that people are trying so hard to make it go away that it actually creates more tension. And so we work, uh, we work on that issue and uh, help people uh, stop trying too hard. Okay. Now, yeah, I would, I would add um, sometimes there can be, it's part of the emotional process as well. You know, you kind of have layers in the psyche and, um, as I work with people, you know, you, you often kind of see they, 
get to a certain point, the pain's reducing, but then it'll kind of stop for a while until we work out, well, what's going on there? You know, what's the underlying issue? And sometimes it takes a little bit of time for that to kind of be able to come to the surface and be processed. Uh, so, yeah, it's quite normal to have that kind of stop-start experience with pain. And, yeah, I just encourage people to, you know, keep, keep working with it, keep working on it. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We've got a question, uh, no name on this one. It says, I've had chronic migraines for many years and have tried a lot of different things to get better. Uh, many experts outline how there could be as many as 20 different root causes. Are migraines more or less responsive to this type of program of working with the brain circuitry versus back issues, et cetera? We treat migraines all the time. Uh, migraine is a form of headache uh, and when you have a diagnosis of migraine, we're assuming that the doctor has looked for a brain tumor or an infection or a inflammation or something like that in the brain. And 99 times out of 100, it's, it's migraine. And migraine is a neural circuit in the brain. People with migraine uh, often have genetic predisposition for it. But it's important to understand that a genetic predisposition is different than a, gen than a genetic disease. Uh, genetic predisposition means that the genes for migraine can be turned on and turned off. And what are they turned on or off by? They're turned on and off by stress. And so by, by understanding that, working on the stressful situation, helping them unwind the neuro, neural circuits for pain, and helping them deal with the triggers that we talked about before. Remember, we talked about triggers such as weather and wind. Uh, migraine headaches often have a lot of triggers such as different foods, chocolate, uh, red wine, lack of sleep, a whole variety of things that are blamed for causing pain. But in fact, they are actually triggers of the neural circuits for pain. So we're very happy when we see people uh, coming in with migraine because that's one of the things we effectively treat. Okay, once again, good news. Um, we've got several people writing in with different forms of neuropathy, different causes, uh, and I understand that your work can address certain types of neuropathy. Can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. It's a similar thing to uh, back pain, certain neuropathies certainly can be caused by a variety of structural disorders, uh, but again, those are rare. So uh, it's, up, it's our job to help people investigate the symptoms. Oftentimes, they are given a diagnosis of neuropathy when, in fact, the nerves are functioning well. For example, uh, if you have neuropathic type pain in the hands or feet, but the sensation is normal, the reflexes are normal, the muscle strength is normal, then the nerves are actually functioning. The pain can be a buzzing, a tingling, a burning, a prickling, a hot, a cold. Uh, and when the uh, nerves are functioning normally, but yet those are the symptoms, then neuropathy is really not the correct diagnosis because neuropathy implies nerve damage. And so in that case, this is something we treat effectively, uh, frequently. Hmm. Okay, great. And then uh, let's take this. Uh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Well, maybe just to be clear, I think Howard's mentioned it a few times, but, um, you know, most people with chronic pain have seen a lot of different doctors and maybe a lot of uh, alternative or complementary medicine as well. It is important that for people embark on this program, you know, that they have uh, seen their local doctor and just made sure that they don't have another underlying uh, serious cause for the pain, that the doctor's, you know, seen them and ruled out um, cancer or another organic cause for the, for the pain. Presumably, most people uh, will have already, you know, seen one or two or four or five doctors i know i certainly did but just to uh, make that note that that's um, our expectation that people have already seen a doctor to have those kind of things ruled out okay great yeah that makes a lot of sense 
Um, let's see if we can squeeze in one or two more questions here. We've got people writing in that they've had uh, back surgery or neck surgery that supposedly fixed the problem, but they're still in a lot of pain. Is there an explanation for this? Yeah, very good explanation. Uh, when the doctor says the surgery went well, but the pain is persisting or even worse, uh, that's a sign that the brain has taken over and that it's the brain causing pain rather than the structures in the neck or back, number one. Number two, injuries heal. So if you've had surgery, that's an injury that's being induced by the medical profession, but that injury heals. And so sometimes people are blaming their pain on the surgery when in fact the surgery went fine and that, of course, needs to be checked out uh, as long as there's no evidence of some kind of neurologic damage that the surgery caused, which usually there isn't. Then what's happening is that the brain is the culprit. The neural circuits are what's causing the pain. For people who have a very, very highly sensitized danger alarm mechanism, particularly people with childhood or ongoing emotional distress or trauma, the surgery can make things worse because it's viewed as an assault by their danger alarm mechanism. So we see that uh, fairly frequently. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, wow. Uh, so we've covered a huge range of things that your work can help with. Let's sort of narrow this down. What can it not help with? Well, we're not treating people with cancer. We're not treating people... Uh, for the most part with autoimmune diseases, uh, although there may be some work with that, but that's not our focus. Uh, we're not treating people with neurologic disorders like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, we're not uh, treating people with severe infections uh, such as tuberculosis or HIV. Uh, Many times people have been diagnosed with Lyme disease when in fact they don't have it. And so, uh, but we don't treat Lyme disease per se, but uh, we treat people with mind-body disorders. And those are extremely common. And so that's, that's our focus and we can help people. And uh, we don't want to enroll somebody in the course who shouldn't be there. And uh, one of the things we're offering is to answer people's questions. And so if someone has a question about whether they should be in the course or not, we'll answer it. Okay, wow. Well, this has just been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I want to thank our viewers for being with us today. And for all of your questions, you're the ones who make these conversations. Uh, once again, Freedom from Chronic Pain starts Wednesday, November 6th. And again, you can visit freedomfromchronicpaincourse.com to learn more and to register. So before we cut you loose, Hal, Howard, do you have any final words for our viewers? Let's go with Hal first. Uh, just thanks everyone for tuning in uh, and for, yeah, you know, listening to what we have to say. Hope you've got some value out of it. And yeah, if you're feeling to join us in the course, we're gonna give it 100%. And um, yeah, we're welcome welcome you to go on your own healing journey. So thanks. From my point of view, uh, our, we're going we're gonna to be as educational as we possibly can. We're going to be as interactive and, and um, present and uh, uh, connecting to people and answering questions. We're going to have fun. Uh, we hope this course will be effective because what keeps us going is the results. When, when, when people get this and work on it, the results are amazing, and uh, it's just extremely gratifying. So, again, thank you. Thank to, thanks to Schiff, Shift, and thank you, Lisa. <laughs> thank you, Howard, for making sure you got that F in there. <laughs> and thank you both, Helen Howard. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with both of you today. And once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. On behalf of all of us at the Ship Network, I wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>